Hey everyone, this is David Hilster, and I'm coming to you from Boca Raton, Florida. It's 10 a.m. in the morning Eastern Standard Time, and I welcome everybody from the CMPS. Uh, those of people who are also watching on my Dissident Science channel, I want to welcome everybody. I'm going to be hosting today a really great talk uh, from a person who <clears throat> he has just published his book. I got it right. Uh... Here, in fact, uh, he published the book, uh, which we uh, talked about last week, uh, Earth, The Hidden History of Earth Expansion, uh, told by researchers creating a modern theory of the Earth. Uh, it was really great. If you haven't seen it, you can go to either channel. We have a couple of places you can watch, uh, watch it. You can go to youtube.naturalphilosophy.org, and you can see the recording of the live session there. Or you can also go to youtube.dissidentscience.com and see it there as well. I'm broadcasting live to both of those channels today, uh, exposing some of my over now over 3,000 subscribers to the CMPS and what it's doing, as well as uh, those people in the CMPS uh, who are here every Saturday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 7 a.m. Pacific Time, in England time, I think it's at 3 p.m. So uh, you don't want to miss this. We also have another um, website you can go to if you want to learn more about the CPN, uh, CPN, <laughs> the John Chappelle Natural Philosophy uh, uh, Society, which was actually founded in the early 1990s. It uh, was at that time known as the Natural Philosophy Alliance. It changed names in 2015. And uh, we have a database of over 10,000 pages of people working outside the mainstream, including hundreds of books and thousands of articles and thousands of scientists and their profiles. So um, you want to check that out if you're from the Dissident Science ch uh, channel. Also, uh, again, if you are from Dissident Science, again, I welcome, welcome you. Uh, and uh, you can go and check out this organization, the CMPS. <clears throat> I'm one of the directors of the CMPS. That's how I got involved in all this. So it's, um, you know, great organization. And also we have uh, the, t well, we have the two websites, naturalphilosophy.org and we have sciencewoke.org. Now sciencewoke.org is a place you can go if you're not so technically inclined. It is an online news magazine for uh, those uh, people who are uh, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> it's an online newspaper uh, uh, magazine for critical thinkers written in a more popular uh, news style. So I think uh, you're going to really enjoy that. Uh, if you haven't been there, it really breaks things down for you. What's wrong with science? We even have a problems area. We have the scientists who are the newer scientists outside the mainstream. You get a little interesting bios about them and works and lots of lots of interesting articles. So uh, again, I welcome you and uh, believe it or not, I do have the slides here, uh, but I don't have the uh, speakers not yet has joined us. I've sent him a message because he is in England. It's 3 p.m. Um, I don't know if it's a problem people can have sometimes with the Internet, but he definitely knows about it because he sent me these slides. So the CMPS 18 July 20 uh, can we calculate paleogravity now um, it is an amazing talk um, um, what is paleogravity well paleogravity is the study of the strength of gravity um, uh, through ancient times and ancient rocks whether it's geological or it's fossils uh, based on fossils he's going to be talking about the fossils today but um, uh, we're, we are still, <laughs> unfortunately, waiting for him. Now, I would just say um, uh, that, you know, and in case he doesn't show up, I'm not sure. I can go through it because I know his talk. I, I've, I've seen this. I think he has even a video about it. But uh, I certainly don't want to usurp him. But uh, normally he's on, uh, uh, comes on a lot earlier than this. But... Uh, uh, he comes on beforehand. Oh, no, normally, my guests will do that. But if you do want to check out um, the website uh, that, uh, uh, from Stephen Hurl, um, you can, uh, Hurrell, 
Uh, you can do so by going to this website, dinox.org. And so we're really looking uh, forward to this talk. Um, and hopefully uh, we will uh, have him join any minute. So um, I, I will check my emails just in case. But uh, I see people are joining in the uh, uh, in our lobby, and uh, of course, people are waiting uh, for this for this uh, pretty interesting talk. Now, um, for those of you who are new, I know uh, right now I can see people from both the CMPS and we, we do have counts of people who are watching. Again, I want to welcome everybody from Dissident Science and also CMPS, the Natural Philosophy uh, dot org. Um, uh, Expansion tectonics, for those who are not familiar with it, um, talks about the um, the Earth and the plate tectonics actually uh, are not floating around and moving, but are actually fixed, and the Earth's radius is growing. So what we see as growth in the oceans and growth around the, um, uh, uh, for instance, Antarctica, all of those plates in the mid mid ridges are actually adding um, new ocean floor all the time, and expansion tectonics says, well, uh, that that is not being subducted. There is some subduction, but very little subduction. Meaning, uh, the plates are growing, and then the, those plates are growing. They'll they'll dive into uh, or uh, subduction would be while they're growing uh, in the middle of the ocean here, and they're moving along. Then they go under. They subduct like this. Uh, that's what uh, mainstream science says. That's um, uh, the what we call uh, uh, plate tectonics, that the plates are moving around sort of uh, almost willy-nilly, uh, driven by currents underneath in the uh, magna, magma. And uh, But expansion tectoni uh, tectonics says that, in fact, no, they're not even moving at all. What's happening is the, the plates about 250 million years ago cracked and uh, the expansion started expanding. The Earth has been expanding for many, um, for billions of years actually. And the, during those billions of years, we have um, uh, the expansion going on, cracking open, cracking the plates. And as the plates, uh, the Earth gets bigger, the plates are separating, uh, water's filling in through those mid-oceanic ridges, water's pumping through. We, we, you can see that. We've got, you can go on, look, look up black smokers. You'll see that water's pouring out of these things in the mid-ocean uh, ridges uh, where uh, new ocean floors are being made. And that has um, uh, given rise to the theory of expansion tectonics, which actually plate tectonics and expansion tectonics were more or less equal in the early 1960s, and then the um, uh, the geological uh, community decided that both of them were radical, but they'd rather go with the plate tectonics because the idea that the Earth's expanding and gaining mass was just too much, I think, for them to take. So uh, again, um, we're waiting for Steve Earle. Uh, this is the uh, talk he, he's going to be giving. Uh, <clears throat> Um, again, if this doesn't happen, let's see what time it is. It's now 10.08, uh, uh, um, but uh, we'll be waiting for uh, him for, I'm going to give him two more minutes. If not, then what I'll do is I'm going to go through his talk uh, with the slides, and um, I, I will try to interpret them the best I can because people are coming to see this. So... Um, Anyways, uh, I want to welcome everybody again. Let's see, do we have him trying to connect yet? Um, so, oh, yes, I do. Device is not connected. Okay, so he is trying to connect. It sounds like he's having problems, or maybe he didn't really know how to uh, connect. But some he is in uh, a little bit north of Liverpool in the UK. So we are uh, waiting for them, for him. So I see him trying to connect, which is a good sign. But I also know today and age, the way it's going with the, uh, the, the uh, crisis and everything going on with the uh, virus, uh, the, the uh, networks are always being strained. I know I work, I'm a computer scientist by trade, and uh, networks are being strained to the max. I'm trying to get my uh, video here right. There we go. But the uh, networks are really being strained because people, so many people are working from home. 
Um, I do. Okay, he's uh, he has been trying to connect. So, anyways, um, I just want to say hello to uh, uh, some people here who are sitting in. Um, I'm gonna. I did this to Ian before. Hey, Ian, I'm gonna uh, bring you up here. So, uh, hey, how are you? Oops. He's gone. That's funny. We are definitely having problems with people uh, connecting. So I just tried to connect him. I'm hoping everybody can hear me correctly and, and fine. Uh, anyways, good morning, everybody. Uh, if you are listening, I see people uh, imagining if, if they couldn't hear me, they'd say something. Well, we got Stephen Hurl. We have Ian. Ian was... Uh, popping in but i think steven is looking like he is coming coming to it again if you want to check out steven's work go to dinox.org um and uh let's see if we can oh i think we are getting the man himself um let me make sure i can hear audio uh headphones okay i should Okay, so I'm going to see if we can bring him up. All right, Stephen, are you there? He may be muted. Sounds like he's having problems maybe with his connection. You can see it's pretty, it's slow there. Now we can, you just do your voice. Um, you, you may, because if you're having connections, Stephen, oh. you, you may, you may want to just uh, turn off your video and we can just hear you because uh, sometimes that will help. In, in the uh, again, we're with Stephen Hurl. If you're looking for can uh, we calculate paleogravity, we're here to talk about how ancient fossils will tell us a little bit about what the strength of gravity was. And I think you're going to be very surprised. It's really a compelling evidence. And uh, there we go. So uh, say hello, Stephen. Hello. We're still not hearing. Oh, I'm I'm hearing him type, or maybe okay. that's somebody. Else. Are you there? Hello, one, two, three. Apologize, folks. This is the new uh, world we live in. So, uh, hello? One, two, three. Testing Mr. Stephen Hurl. This is how he smells it. Hurl is the way he pronounces it. Not Hurl, which is, but he said he'll accept either way. Are you there? Okay. Okay, I think I'm hearing you now. Say something. No. Stop. Oh, he's not hearing us, I think. I think that's the problem. Sometimes what happens with this is he does not hear you. Um, we are waiting for to talk about can we calculate paleogravity? So uh, we're almost there, hopefully. Stephen, if you're hearing me, uh, if you're not hearing me, then uh, you may want to connect and disconnect and come back again. But, um, hello. Stephen, are you there? I'm hearing you. I'm, I, um, I'm hearing, I'm hearing you. Yes, I can hear it. Seems very uh, as it did last week <laughs> yeah it sounds like that you're having problems with your internet connection uh, where you are hello. oh hello david yes 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 it's you... nice to uh nice to be back again this week okay well we'll just start out with your slides can you talk can you see the slides and can we can begin just let me know when you want to switch slides Yes, I can just about hear you. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, we're not being able to hear you. It's cutting in and out constantly. Uh, maybe I can get people in our I lobby, which are which are sitting in our lobby, to you maybe perhaps turn off. Hear me too. I can hear you, but it's coming through very sporadically. 
I think the connection is really, really slow. So they try to, you know, do the best they can. But maybe if people in the lobby also can turn off their videos, because yes. I, I, um, uh, you already did, but maybe other people as well. Um, that may be something that could help the, um, I know Dennis is there, Ian, if you guys could turn off your videos for now, we greatly appreciate it. I think, you know, maybe a few connections may help. I don't know. Um, can you say, uh, can you talk again? Say something, uh, Steve? Uh, um, shall I go on the next? I'm sorry? Do you have a, maybe a telephone you could use? Because this works also on telephone or... Because right now your internet connection is not working for us to get you to be able to to, to be able to hear you um, at all. We're not hearing you. We'll hear you once in a while. Hello. Uh, hello. Hello. Did you want to try to join again and come back in, or? I. I think he did that. Again, I apologize. Uh, these things uh, do happen. Stick around because <clears throat> either way, we're going to go through the slides, whether it's m myself or hopefully with Stephen, because it'd be much more interesting. I appreciate those people in the live lounge t uh, turning off their videos. Uh, what really is happening here is the connection from him. His side isn't working out. Last week it was working out fine. This week, not so, <clears throat> not so fine. I know how that is. So our internet goes down. Our electric electricity goes down, etc. So um, I do have a faster connection because I work from home and I am a computer guy. So I need the good connection. So hopefully uh, we'll have him pop popping back in very shortly. Uh, so we'll start this. And if not, then, <clears throat> well, I'm not sure if we should give it a try to go through the his talk or not. But um, that's that would be my intention. All right. So again, uh, if you just tuned in, don't tune out where, what's happening. We're having a little connection problems with our main speaker, Stephen Hurl. Uh, have you haven't gotten or uh, uh, read his book or no? Uh, take a look at. Let me put his uh, website up again. You can go to his website and get all the information about this. But this is his um, uh, latest book, The Hidden History of Expansion, Earth Expansion told by researchers creating modern theory on Earth. It does uh, support the expansion tectonics uh, theory, which uh, a lot of us, uh, once you look at the data, it's really hard to believe that the Earth isn't expanding. But uh, we're waiting for him to join up because he's going to be giving a talk today about can we calculate pale paleogravity. Again, paleogravity is the, is the science, I guess, or the study of the strength of gravity uh, through Paleolithic times, all the way back as many as, many as billions of years ago. And uh, he's got a really interesting talk talking about animals, in this case, uh, dinosaurs and uh, their bones and their mass. Uh, quite interesting where you can chart it. And, and believe it or not, charting that will actually line up with a lot of the other people in expansion tectonics that looked at gravity in, just in a uh, in, in different ways, it ends up uh, supporting a lot of uh, other people who are into the expansion tectonics. So. All righty, um, still not joining up yet. Um, all righty, let me, uh, what I'll do is I'll slowly go through these. Um, hopefully he will uh, get, become, come here. But uh, can we calculate, uh, let's start out with the slides today. And um, can we calculate paleogravity? And hopefully if he comes, then we can go back through the slides. But um, uh, this is his definition for paleogravity. Uh, paleogravity, the strength of the Earth's surface gravity in the past. Um, again, the idea is that gravity itself isn't changing, but the gravity on the surface of the Earth uh, changes. And of course, you'll have a question about that. And uh, that question is, um, is that the right one? Yeah. That question is, okay, what is gravity? Well, it's weight over mass, of course, on Earth, 1G. That's why we call it G. G is a constant that we came up to, to uh, be able to easily cal calculate gravitational force. Of course, on the moon, it's 1,6G. And on other planets, it can be either higher or lower. Uh, but that's how we calculate it. Um, 
Uh, gravity, of course, is equal to weight over the mass. Uh, uh, that's the weight is really the pushing down of gravity on a mass, and that's how we uh, calculate gravity. And of course, paleogravity has to be the same. We have to look at the weight over the mass, uh, and so that's how he goes about um, uh, making his calculations, which are quite quite amazing. Again, stick around, folks. This is uh, this evidence is is pretty pretty amazing. So uh, again, gravity is is equal to the weight over mass. Now these are all the dinosaur models uh, I believe that Stephen has. Um, he, he's uh, trying to hook up here. Hopefully we can get him. He's still his uh, internet isn't working so well, uh, but uh, he uh, has these model uh, actual 3D dinosaurs. I suppose he's probably paying some good money for them because those don't look like uh, just regular uh, dinosaur models. So uh, let's see if we can get him uh, to us here, if he's uh, connected with and can hear us or we can hear him. It's really been more of a case of hearing him. Stephen, um, I am putting you back online here. Can we hear you? Say something? Uh, well, I can hear you. Okay, good. We can hear you. Can hear me now. Okay, so I'm going to. Yes. I'm going to. Okay, I can. We can hear you. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go back with the slides. All right, and uh, have you start, and hopefully we'll hear you. If I find that your audio is not coming through, then we maybe have to sort of punt again. So go ahead, start your talk. Um, my talk today asks the question: Can we? calculate paleogravity. Before we ask that question, perhaps I should explain what paleogravity is. We all know what gravity is. It is that force which holds us down to the ground. Paleo just means ancient. So paleogravity is simply the strength of the Earth's surface gravity in the past. It is widely imagined that paleogravity has been the same for hundreds of millions of years. This raises an interesting question. Is there any scientific method to check this common assumption? At first, it might seem that we would need a time machine to measure paleogravity, but let's explore the possibility further. Uh, and then next, next slide, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, measuring surface gravity today is a simple scientific procedure. Only two measurements are required, weight and mass. We can measure the weight of a known mass and then use these values to calculate paleogravity. On Earth, astronauts weigh a certain amount. On the Moon, they weigh only one-sixth what they did on Earth, but their mass has stayed the same. Next uh, uh, slide, please. Uh, so we can therefore measure gravity with a simple weight mass formula. If we had a time machine, we could send our astronauts back into the past to measure the weight, and this would enable us to calculate paleogravity. To calculate paleogravity if we could calculate the weight of any known mass that we know existed in the past. Uh, uh, next slide, please. A prehistoric animal could be used to calculate paleogravity using the weight mass mass. Let's consider how we might calculate it. the weight of an animal. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. It's coming okay. as a delay. Um, Anderson and his team studied the bones of a uh, slight delay. <laughs> uh, Anderson and his team studied the bones of a relia, calculate the weight of an animal based on the dimensions of its leg bone. This, this formula can predict the weight of land based and can actually uh, see the line that uh, this formula produces 
and we can actually see uh, the the various uh, brand, uh, square uh, dots are actually the actual weight but a data around gives a fairly good prediction of what the actual weight of the animal is so we could we can say that we can uh, calculate an animal's weight from just the dimensions of its leg bones uh, it, next next slide please Uh, so now let's consider how we could calculate the mass of an animal. The mass of an animal can be calculated by measuring the volume of a scale model and then multiplying that by the relative scale and density of the animal. And here we see a, a figure w which is um, from um, a figure that uh, Alexander produced in, way back in uh, 1989 and he's just um, uh, showing how he can use a model uh, and actually put that in, uh, to, in water to calculate the volume of that model. And then from that, he can then uh, calculate the actual weight of the animal. So paleontologists have produced accurate reconstructions of a large number of prehistoric animals from just their skeletons. And these reconstructions allow the mass of the same land-based animal to be calculated from its body volume. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Using the weight from the bone strength method and the mass from the volume method uh, for, for, for the next slide next slide yes please giraffe titan this animal, this dinosaur, has only recently been renamed and was known as Brachiosaurus for years. In the picture on the left, you can see me standing in front of the Berlin Giraffe Titan. Uh, and you can see exactly how big this animal is. I, th I think uh, you can just about see me in the, um, in the front there. Uh, so if I could actually walk underneath the, uh, that's it, that's me. Yes. So if I could actually walk actually underneath the animal, I think even if I reached up to the to the uh, top, I wouldn't actually be able to reach the uh, where its belly would have been. So uh, that's uh, it's fairly impressive uh, size of animal. Uh, so the picture in the middle is from the Jurassic Park film, and this was the very first dinosaur. Uh, that they, they saw was Giraffe Titan. This is the famous scene where they uh, he, he actually pulls his uh, sunglasses down and uh, looks across to see a Giraffe Titan coming out of the water. Uh, and below that picture, we see a number of scientific reconstructions, and they, they, these really are to get the body volume of the of the animal, therefore calculate the weight. Well, sorry, calculate the mass of the animal. Um, and on the right are a number of models I've used for the um, to actually try and calculate the mass estimates again. Uh, at the top one is from the uh, from a physical model that I've always used by uh, the actual volume of that particular model and then scale it up. And the bottom one is a computer model that I produce and uh from from that uh it's actually uh i can actually calculate the volume directly from that computer model um so uh next slide please i think um so here's the result 
results I got. Uh, so the, this paleogravity calculation indicated that gravity was two million years ago. And you can see, see the red dot there, of, that's it. Uh, now, remember that this, this is a surprising result because the common assumption, G, so, so it should be right up the top there at, at the 1G, and we're actually, my actual result is uh, 0.54G. Uh, so, so next slide, please. And the next dinosaur I looked at was Tyrannosaurus rex. There are at least a dozen skeletons or a dozen specimens of T-rex, and four specimens were suitable for paleogravity calculations. The picture on the left-hand side shows me in front of a cast of the, of the Carnegie T-Rex specimen. Now the Carnegie T-Rex specimen was the very, one of the, ver the very first T-Rex specimen that uh, right, right in um, the early 1900s. So, so, so this is one of the first ones found. Uh, the middle picture shows a stand specimen and, and uh, the stand specimen is from, I think it's around about the 1980s, shows the two and the Wankel T-Rex specimens, which, which are some more specimens. Uh, so could I have the next slide, please? That's it. So, um, so these four specimens produce paleogravity estimates of 0.61 g, 0.64 g, 0.7 million years ago. And could I have the next slide, please? Or I decided to look at was uh, Acrocanthosaurus. And although this dinosaur is about the same length as T Rex, it is a lot less massive because its body is more on the plant view on the bottom right. Uh, you, you can see there that it's it's actually quite a quite a narrow type of animal, and that uh, reduces the mass of the animal quite a bit. And I, th I think also. So you can you can see it face on views as well. Uh, could, it, could I have the next slide, please? And so Acrocanthosaurus produced a paleogravity estimate of 0.54 g at a, around about 113 million years ago. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Uh, and around about 210 million years ago, there were a group of Coelophysis dinosaurs that became trapped in a floodplain. Now, and, and until about the 1940s, this uh, Coelophysis was only known from, from actually one specimen. Um, and, and it's quite a poor, poor specimen. But in about 1940, they actually found this, this uh, whole graveyard of uh, coelophysis and uh, so we can see on the on the right hand side there there's uh, uh, more mature ones and uh, some uh, some uh, smaller smaller ones and that, so we, we, we've got about a hundred of those to be be looking at so it's actually become one of the best known dinosaurs um, uh, from that time at uh, from around about 210 million years ago Uh, and the one on the bottom is just a commercial commercial model that uh, of uh, some of these specimens. So could I have the next slide, please? Uh, and so the two specimens of coelophysis just produced a paleogravity estimates of 0.42 g. Uh, can I have the next slide? Uh, 
And uh, what, what one uh, recent dinosaur discovery was the dino bird, Gigantoraptor. And this, this was actually in the noughties sometime, I think possibly around about 2003. So it's quite a recent, recent discovery. And the picture on the left was taken at the Dinosaurs of China exhibition in the UK. And you can actually see uh, it's uh, from from the size of the people in the background. You can actually see it's it's quite a quite a uh, a large uh, gigantic uh, animal. And the picture on the right is uh, from the BBC Earth uh, just. Gigantoraptor, uh, and this. Uh, the, 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 so, so you can actually see quite a bit uh, reconstructions of those. So, could, could I have the next next slide, please? Okay. Uh, so, Gigantoraptor gives a paleogravity estimate of 0.61 g at 80 million years ago. Uh, next slide, please. And Tylosaurus is one of the armored dinosaurs are quite remarkable. On the picture on the le left, uh, we see a, a related species that was formed a lifelike dinosaur, mommy dinosaurs, so seen to be so accurate. And uh, uh, so, so the, the yeah, that picture on the left is uh, it's actually just a related species, but uh, there are quite a few skin impressions of these types of animals with all the scales uh, on their body, which which form quite well. Uh, and the the picture on the right is one of the dinosaur models models that I use to actually try and calculate the mass, um, which, uh, which, which seems a very good, uh, very accurate uh, reconstruction. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? And the, 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 so this one produced a paleogravity estimate of 0.69 G at 67 million years ago, same time as T-Rex. So it gave me a useful comparison between a bipedal and a quadrupedal animal. And as you see, the, the, if, if, we, uh, if we allow for scatter, uh, the roundabout, the, a similar, similar sort of uh, range um, so, so that's that's quite useful to actually compare um, the bipedal and the quadrupedal formula. Um, so, could we have the next slide, please? And another armored dinosaur was uh, Europlocyphalus, uh, and there are various reconstructions of this animal. Uh, we've got um, w uh, again the 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 uh, picture on the on the left hand side. That was um, actual uh, what I actually used for the uh, pre calculating the mass of the animal, and you can see this is uh, the skeleton is um, actually quite a good uh, dinosaur skeletons, and and I've actually compared various. Um, uh, some reconstructions produced by by various uh, paleontologists as well to, to to just to try and um, uh, check that that the mass estimate uh, was was you know was as accurate as I could. So could I have the next slide, please? So the the uh, Europlocyphalus gives a paleogravity estimate of 0.65 g at around about 67 million years ago.
have the next slide, please. And one well known British dinosaur is in Oxford in the UK. And the British Museum also supplies scale models of Megalosaurus, which can be used to estimate mass. Uh, and on the bottom left hand side, you can you can see me poking through, uh, looking through its uh, mouth. So, so that gives a, a reasonable estimate of how big this animal was. It, it was a fair old size. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Uh, Megalosaurus produces a paleo gravity estimate of 0.51 g at around about 167 million years ago. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, and I, I just, I, I've been doing uh, dinosaurs up until now, but uh, I decided I'd start having a look at uh, some of the mammals because the, the, the obviously the dinosaurs um, went extinct. Uh, 65 million years ago uh, so if I had to actually want to fill in that gap from 65 up to the present day I've got to start to look at some mammals so uh, I've just looked at this one mammal um, which is uh, Paraceratherium which is uh, one, one of the uh, it's actually one of the giant rhinoceros uh, a giant it, it is a giant rhinoceros um, and uh, the one on the left at the top there is uh, from the 1936. It, it was reconstructed at that time quite as a quite heavily reconstructed animal. But if, if we look at towards the right, uh, the, the, the uh, modern day reconstructions tend to reconstruct it as a slightly, a slightly uh, less massive animal. Um, it also has, um, and this giant rhinoceros has also been known by at least three different names, depending on whether it was discovered by British, Russian, or American paleontologists. On the bottom left-hand side, we can see that uh, Donald Prothero has reconstructed the animal with large ears. That's uh, the, the, the one to the right of where the arrow is now, the rhinoceros giants. That's uh, from the cover of uh, Donald Prothero's uh, book, and we can see his ears and uh, some sort of proboscis. But, but they shouldn't affect the mass uh, too much. And then um, the model on the right-hand side is, is what I actually use to help try and uh, calculate the mass. Uh, so, could we have the next slide? And uh, so, Paraceratherium theory produced paleogravity estimates of 0.73 at around about 29 million years ago. Uh, so, could we have the next slide? And these are these are all the estimates of paleogravity was much the same as today's gravity. However, the weight mass method indicates that paleogravity has been slowly increasing towards our present day surface gravity. From the initial increase rather than a linear one. And, and, and we can see there if, if we try and put a straight line through those points, um, it, it wouldn't actually fit. So we need some sort of exponential increase to actually, um, actually get it up to. And I, I've written up all these paleogravity calculations in a series of articles, and you can find them all on my website at uh, this, this um, for more, yes, where the arrow is at DinoX. That's it, DinoX.org. And if you put slash pub, it should take you directly to all those all those uh, articles. Uh, well, well, thank you for listening, and I, and I hope you've I hope all the sound has actually worked uh, worked okay now. Yeah, can you hear me?
Yes, I can hear you fine. Yeah, yeah. Actually, it went pretty well. Um, we had a Good. little bit of cutting out, but uh, I, it, it's really great to have you do it instead of me because I was going to start uh, plowing through these. But, okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> one question. Actually, we have a question. Um, so if you have questions for um, Stephen, then um, you can send them our way. Uh, I can display them here. So Brian Kerr has a question. Can the same thi thing be done with small animals from way back as well? Uh, it, yes. Yeah. It, it shouldn't matter um, how big the animal is. Um, but they'd have to have, do they have to have a femur? The, the, yeah. The, yeah. That's, that's the requirement. They have to have a femur so that uh, we, we can actually calculate the weight um, uh, because, because of, Obviously, the, the, the animal's uh, weight is, is actually um, uh, the, the femur is, is holding up the animal's weight. So it's that that we have to use to actually calculate what, what, uh, what this force might have been in the past. Uh, but it, it, it shouldn't matter. It, 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 just, it just so happens, really, that, um, uh, that there's more scientific research done on large animals than there is on small animals and and it's it, it i think i think it's just like everybody that people are keener to actually uh, do their uh, look look at a large animal because that's where the fascination is uh, so it's actually easier to get the uh, all the all the data for large animals rather than the small ones but 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 yes it should uh, it it, it it won't it won't affect the results uh, at all you know we, we so we so do you think do you think uh, uh would it be interesting then to go back even further and even try smaller i mean uh, animals um than where you've gone or is it just not enough data for that uh well, I, I've gone back uh, 210 million years. Um, oh, come on. We're, we're, you know, your audience <laughs> is wanting more. I mean, <laughs> you, is, you know, that's what the um, audience is here is to push you further. No, I'm kidding. Come on, yeah. But uh, and, this is not sport. <laughs> and and, and uh, b before then, uh, dinosaurs were just evolving then. Uh, so so that, that first animal w was quite a small dinosaur because... because right because it was evolving uh so but, but before that time uh the animals uh, didn't actually have an upright uh, posture they they were more splayed a, a, a bit like an amphibian or well they, they were obviously amphibians uh, so they had a this splayed posture um so i can't actually use this technique on amphibians to 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 actually calculate the right. uh, weight of it, just 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 because of the the posture, the posture is wrong. So, right. Uh, I mean, when they're floating in water, it's it's tough. But you know, yeah. In in reality, though, in reality, it seems to me that you we, you could really develop different techniques for different types of animals. I mean, right now. It's the femur because femurs were used, right? But it, um, one of the things about the idea of paleogravity, at least in my mind, is that there, paleo, this is just one technique, one person looking at one idea, and there are quite a few other ideas out there. So it would seem to me that maybe instead of looking at the femur, some other idea could even be done uh, as to the sizes of even the largest underwater, even if it's just a comparison um, the problem, I, I, well, I guess you'd still, you'd have to come up with in each of those ways, some I, way to calculate from fossils, the mass of those, um, uh, animals, correct? Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah, you're right. Um, and, uh, the, 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 there are other ways. I mean, I mean, uh, blood pressure is one way. We can look at it. Obviously, the the, the um, uh, there's been various calculations done that the largest sauropod dinosaurs, uh, their heads were so high that um, the blood pressure would actually right. burst their hearts, and and obviously the reason for this uh, pressure would be reduced, actually on the on their hearts. So 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 there's quite a bit of um, you know, interesting calculations to right. do there, I think.
think, right, right, right. Uh, to go through. And then, then there's also tints of uh, various sauropods uh, don't seem to be strong enough to actually support their heads. Uh, and again, the, the, there's another interesting area there of, of actually how we could uh, calculate the the uh, the gravity from the size of the neck. Uh, neck ligaments uh, don't actually fossilize, so so we're actually inferring uh, how big the ligaments would be. Uh, from just just bones, so, so results might be. Okay, so so there are physiological um, calculations that can be done. I know um, I've heard other people mention about the the heart size and blood pumping and pressure because that is a problem as well. Um, here's another question uh, from Dr. Lucas. He was asking: Was C14 decay used to determine the age of the the bones for the uh, dinosaurs? Uh, no, no, it wasn't um, carbon-14. Um, uh, carbon-14 only goes up back to about, uh, I think, 20,000 years, I think. I, I, I might be wrong there, but in, in fact, it doesn't go back far enough. Right. Uh, so, so, so the ages we use when, when we're talking of in terms of um, these tens of millions of years, uh, the type of things they use is uh, radioactive decay. Uh, so so the, the, they'll actually look at various isotopes within the rocks. And, uh, and from measuring that, they can, they can actually get a reasonable estimate of what age that rock is. Uh, and and uh, the, the, there's actually various isotopes that they can use uh, because some, because obviously they decay at a different rate, so so there's overlapping um, ages that they can actually use. So 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 no, it wasn't wasn't carbon fourteen, but it's uh, it it's a similar idea, but carbon fourteen doesn't go back back far enough in time. Okay, here's a, another common question. It's uh, from Brian Kerr. I like the Electric Universe's EU as well. They take the approach that the matter of the planet got more massive rather than the planet getting more matter. Now, that maybe you can uh, make a comment on that because we're talking about obviously mass, matter, volume, weight. Um, what 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 is what you've done? Be able to make a because there uh, obviously there are some people who are uncomfortable with the idea that the Earth has gained mass. Um, that it, it, just like there are people who were uncomfortable in the 19, early 1960s. Well, in the early 1960s, the poor geologists, I, I was sort of laughing after our, your talk last week, thinking about those poor geologists who were thinking the older generation going, oh my gosh, people are trying to th tell us that continents are moving. That's, oh, I, I don't know if I can accept that. Then someone else comes along and says, oh, not only really, they, they're not really moving. The whole earth's expanding and emitting yes. mass. I mean, so they, they were like pulling their hair out. So they went for the, how do you say, the lesser of two evils, I guess you could say. But, That's um, right, yes. Yeah, in, in this, I think there are some people, even in the dissident world, who do not like the idea that, you know, the earth would be gaining mass. But that I think that you can sort of glean from Brian Kerr's comment that maybe people in the electric universe are looking at, well, the volume of the earth has uh, increased, but the mass hasn't. What what would you say ab about that? I know I have my own opinion, but I have read a lot of stuff. But what, what does this um, a study of paleogravity tell us? Is it actually the actual mass of the Earth increasing, uh, you know, whether the volume is increasing proportionally or not, that's a different question. But is the mass, the amount of stuff that the Earth is made of, uh, increasing according to your work? Um, well, uh, I think the key point of uh, these results is that um, I, I'm only measuring the uh, paleogravity of the Earth here. Uh, and so, so this is a, a completely independent method, if you like, of of whether you use, whether whether you you want to look at the electric universe or whether you look at the expanding Earth. Um, but 
But having said that, um, because it's completely independent, if if we actually plot uh, the uh, results of paleogravity, and if if we compare that the the results which uh, James Maxlow has got uh, from his expanding Earth model, right. um, when when he he looks at um, what paleogravity would be on uh, with a, an increasing mass of Earth expansion, his results are virtually identical to the results I'm getting here from from a completely different, um, you know, fr fr from a, a different, completely different uh, set of data. Uh, yeah, that's so, pretty shocking. Yeah. So, so, so I, I mean, from that, way. yes, yeah. Um, uh, so, so from that, I, I infer that um, the expanding Earth model uh, with increasing mass is 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 the but the most likely model that is true. I think. Um, yeah, and and yeah. I think I th because the other alternatives you have to look just logically. What are the other alternatives? Well, the other alternative is that gravity itself is changing, and yes, there are some. Yes. I think there are mm. some people who who do purport that. I, I, I know that Dr. Lucas, who asked one of the questions, um, and he's talked about it, he calls, talks about gravity decaying. Uh, that's in his model. Now, I'm not sure if that really uh, it goes along with the idea that, in fact, the mass isn't increasing, but uh, gravity is, is, is decreasing. But uh, regardless, um, what, what I think what you're saying and what I understand as well is that um, the mass increase, if you look at all the different, even the models in the universe, all the different possibilities logically, I think the idea of mass increase seems to be a, you know, Occam's razor choice in my opinion. It seems to make the most logical sense uh, because if all of a sudden you have gravity and it's changing, you yes, know, yes. That's, mm. that, that is a real, how do you say, that's a real hard pill to swallow because that means physics is really way beyond than, you know, a force of gravity being sort of the same. But, um, uh, you know, but again, again, those are uh, obviously they're all possibility. Now, you were saying that one of the things that was interesting to me was that um, when we were talking with... Um, uh, when I was talking uh, numerous times, I got to meet James Maxlow. One of the things he was, he contacted, well, I, I talked with him many, you know, about probably over, over 10 years ago, but he had mentioned he wanted really people in our organization to try to give some uh, idea of what, you know, what could cause mass increase. Um, but he was so convinced, I'm, I'm, I don't want to talk about that today because that's a whole nother idea. I mean, I think that could be an interesting talk uh, in itself is just what kinds of mechanisms would be possible for the mass increase. But I was more fascinated by what in the heck was he seeing that in geology, because he wasn't looking at femur bone size, even though even Carrie mentioned you as sort of another data point. Um, you know, Samuel Warren Carey, you know, one of the great geologists of, of our, our generations, he he, he obviously James Maxwell had some idea that okay I'm seeing geological evidence that masses increase. Do you know I, I can't remember off the top of my head what that explanation was. Do you remember what he had mentioned specifically about that? Um, I, yeah, I think I think if we go right back to the 1960s, um, the, the, they were obviously seeing geological evidence that the earth had increased in diameter. Uh, and, and one of the very early ideas was that um, in some way all, all the material in the earth had, uh, had just increased in volume while right. keeping, keeping the same mass. So, right. Like so, some, so, something nuclear reaction or something going inside and it's nothing yes. else is being added, but it's like, okay, now it's going nuclear. Now it's starting to create gases, gas, of course, and more space, blah, 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 that sort of thing. So, Okay, yeah, so that was in yeah, the 1960s. So, Continue. So, so, so 1960s, um, and uh, and uh, uh, of course, we, when you run the calculation on that, uh, 
because the mass of the Earth is the same, if if we uh, reduce that volume down to half the diameter, then it, then of course the force of gravity will increase, and it, it'll actually go up by about four times. Uh, so so they they had a the very real problem there that they were saying that gravity was must be four times, but then. Uh, so, so, so it, even life today would struggle in four times the uh, current force of gravity. Right. Uh, right. So, 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 it, so in a way, it was it was gravity that uh, that sort of forced everybody to think that uh, well, it, it it can't possibly be that um, uh, we've got the constant Earth constant mass model. Uh, because because uh, you know animals couldn't exist in uh, foot, foot four times uh, gravity. So okay. uh, so so do you think so? Okay, I'm not I'm not understanding one part. I apologize. So you're in the 1960s when the uh, the uh, the uh, senior members of the geological you know world uh, community were were struggling. Well, is it you know? Is, is it play tectonics or would it be expansion tectonics? Um, are you saying gravity played a role in that and where the community turned? Um, well, I th in, in the 1960s, no, 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 nobody had actually thought of that uh, yet. And I, I think um, I think it was it was must have been about the 1980s, sometime like that, that that um, people uh, started to realize well well hang on a minute it can't be that because um you know the the force of gravity must have been too much uh and uh that actually came about um uh, Carey actually held his um held an expanding earth the first expanding earth conference and that actually came up in the first expanding earth conference uh so i i think at that time that that must have for I I, th I, I, I think even before then, Carey was thinking that um, the constant Earth model was the one to go for. But huh. obviously, ob obviously, when uh, they had this uh, this conference and it was pointed out, well, that can't be true. Then the only model left was the expanding uh, the expanding mass model. So you're uh, saying Carey didn't come into the expansion tectonics, really put his feet into that that side of the argument until in the '80s? No, no, uh, no I mean, I, no, I mean, he. Okay, no, I'm sorry. No, 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 he, 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 he was he was arguing about it. it well, he he was presenting this idea right back in 1956. Was the first time. Oh, sure. Sure, so sure. so he presented the expanding Earth model. But he, he didn't realize that the constant mass model was what, you know, just couldn't happen. OK, I uh, see. at that time. So 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 it I think it was around about 19, 1981, I think it was that um, that that it, it became evident that uh, that the constant uh, mass model wasn't wasn't correct. Right. Uh, so, so so it so. Or, I mean, you might you might well think that all these things appear to appear to everybody instantaneously. All these ideas yeah, about of course, of course, about yeah. everything, but but in fact, it it takes decades for the, these ideas sure. to to sort of you know mull through, and then various people sure. say other things, and that they, they they say, oh well, what about this? And then then eventually these ideas congeal in, into what we've got today which which is basically that um uh the, the all the geological evidence shows that the earth has expanded uh and we we know that uh, it must have expanded from adding mass to the earth well i think uh, it so, can be so, but i think one of the things is, is though and it may be true um and, and this is a talking about more specifics but in, in my mind, and because I've been reading about this myself since 2008 and reading all the books, everything I could, it can't, I, in some sense, the way I look at it is the mass increases, but I think chemically, um, there's also things that can happen. 
So um, I, I, I am personally, um, in my, my own mind, where I sit, I think that it's mass increase, but I think the exponential part isn't only mass increase. I don't think mass increase is necessarily exponential right now. It could be that simply, because I think one of the th reasons I think that, um, um, Stephen, is because of the crack up of the, I mean, if you look at the way the Earth's expanded, yeah, it's getting to exponential, but there seems to be maybe other things maybe also happening at the same time because all of a sudden you had the crack up of the continents and you have water pouring through that um, according to other people um, methane and oil and water are being more pr are produced inside the earth and, and and that's why we have oil at 20,000 feet and water at 25,000 feet now that they're finding um, it could be that it could be the case that the actual expansion has gone is going a little bit more is because there's not only Earth, I mean, mass mass increase, but perhaps uh, some kind of nuclear or things going on that is also now increasing the volume as well. Is that mm, is that something mm. you see what I mean? So I, 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 I'm sort of in my own mind think that's still a possibility. OK, but um, that's just. You know, uh, uh, you know, we neither one of us going to have any answer for that. But here is Cornelius uh, uh. Vehe. Uh, could the Earth not just be? It's a question on the screen. Could the Earth not just be expanding and the continents be sp uh, split up just by accumulation of matter, matter from comet and uh, me meteorite materials, etc.? Um, yeah, well, well, that that was actually the explanation I gave in my book. Um, Dinosaurs and the expanding Earth. Um, so, so, so I actually said that uh, it could possibly just be uh, material from outer space. Um, and the, w when I looked at it, uh, the material at the moment uh, is is actually not enough, right, uh, to actually account for all that m mass increase. Uh, so, so. Uh, I postulated that um, possibly the material might have been greater in the past. And I was thinking perhaps in the ice ages, we could imagine the Earth and the sun system entering a cosmic cloud of dust. Uh, this, this could uh, decrease the amount of uh, sunlight that was getting through, causing an ice age. And at that point, there'd be a lot more of uh, cosmic dust actually coming down on t onto the Earth, and that would increase the uh, increase the size of the Earth. Now, now, now the big problem with with uh, th this idea is that uh, all the Earth expansion, all the geologists uh, actually see Earth expansion coming from the interior of the Earth. Yes. Absolutely. So, so the problem is, how can we account for that material uh, coming from the outside of the Earth to the inside? And, uh, and so, so the idea I present uh, was down into the uh, subduction zones. And could we imagine subduction zones as being isolated areas where the with the uh, cosmic material, because it was slightly uh, going down into the interior of the Earth uh, over millions of years. Uh, so, 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 so that was the that was the idea I, I presented, um, and uh, cert certainly are that keen on that. Uh, James Max Low uh, certainly does like that idea that would be possible <laughs> so uh uh so so you know that that yeah. that's certainly that's certainly yeah i something. think one of the problems is though too i think one of the other problems too with the idea even of subduction um uh Stephen, is that it look at antarctica that's one of the biggest problems with plate tectonics one of the arguments when people are arguing this you know expansion tectonics well, just take a look at Antarctica. You've got a real problem with our Antarctica. There's no subduction going on in, in, in our Antarctica. 
you have only expansion around it. So how is how is it supposed to be that the Earth is going to stay, you know, the same radius? You know, that's, uh, and so one of the things that I know, and so I can't forget which book, it may have been Carrie's book, but the amount of subduction needed to keep the Earth the same radius is, and that's why, you know, they envision subduction. Mm-hmm. They, can, mm-hmm. they can push it to the limit, 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 and maybe, if you exaggerate a lot, you can get 30% of the subduction you need to keep the radius the same. But no one ever talks about that, right? So mm-hmm. um, the whole idea of the subduction, I think that's one of the things, you know, that doesn't make sense. The other thing that, to me, that doesn't make sense about it being accretion, which I think is what the official word is for gathering mass on Mm -hmm. the earth Mm -hmm. for accretion is the idea that you really the mag like you were saying well you know what we are seeing increasing is the is the floor of the ocean the materials coming from within so at least what you were trying to do as well subduction takes that in well you know james maxwell is going to say wait a minute you don't have enough subduction at all even to keep the earth's radius the same yeah. alone <laughs> you know and the other thing is yeah okay your your earth has more you know surface area therefore it's going to get more you know mass but i think uh, i think pretty much those who have subscribed or looked into this seriously for many years i think the the general consensus in expansion tectonics is that Probably that, you know, there is something going subatomic on going on where, you know, uh, atoms become bigger atoms in the middle of suns. Why can't that happen in a core of the Earth? If the core of the Earth looks the same as the core of a sun, then why isn't it the case that we it can't be, you know, taking raw materials at the subatomic level, making, you know, more mass? So let's see it, if we it, have some. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think John Eichler's um, actually the one who's come up with one of the most popular ideas at the moment, which is is just the uh, material from the sun is actually streaming out right. and it's it's being captured by our magnetic field. Right. And the, the, uh, we, 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 I, I mean, he was on last week uh, talking about it. And uh, obviously these protons actually come down and they can actually yeah. flow into the interior of the earth just because they're so small. And and certainly James uh, uh, Maxlow has uh, has uh, sort of signed on with that idea. Yeah. And I, I think... actually, we do too. We have a, our books coming out, and mm-hmm. I made a graphic with that same idea. Right. And, yes. Uh, and so uh, it's actually got um, in in our book. I made a diagram of exactly that process. I think that was sort of uh, postulated by a lot of people separately. And, uh, what, you know, one of those things, like even with the Earth expansion, you have a lot of people isolated come up with that kind yeah, of idea. Yeah, so, yeah. So, no, I, I, yeah. Yeah, I, lean, I lean toward that idea as well. Our model sort of uh, leans toward that idea as well. Let's see. Um, let's see if I can find a... Okay, uh, here we go. Here's another one. Uh, Cornelius says, Why could the ocean simply not put pressure on Earth's crust that forces the material out of the core of the oceans increases in size? That's probably more of a James Maxwell question. <laughs> mm, mm, probably. Unless you, yeah. can, unle- unless you can answer that. Uh, uh, no, I don't think I can. Why should the ocean not put pressure on the Earth's crust? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I think. I think what I can say to that, and from what I've read, one of the biggest problems with subduction, just subduction in itself, let alone pressure from the water. Is that the idea that um, uh, the crust, the, the the floor could actually subduct under, under, under with the pressures that it has, uh, seems somewhat silly to some people who are more ge- are on the geological side. They're looking at the density of rock, the way rock works, um, the ability to subduct, and I think one of the arguments I've heard for not subducting, which is sort of related, is that it's just the mass of rock, the forces involved, that it just couldn't happen. So mm-hmm. I'm just I'm just probably going to take a guess that an answer could be is that the pressure from the ocean is simply not enough pressure with the gravitational pressure to be, you know, force material, material out. The other question would be, too, is why would it force material out at a specific speed? you know, that specific line. I mm-hmm. mean, otherwise, yeah, you get hot spots now and then, but uh, I think that's an interesting, you know, it's an, in- it's an interesting question. 
All yeah, right, yeah. I, I, I mean, uh, last week as well, uh, Dr. Khan, he, he was actually, um, he'd actually produced a calculation in the book um, of actually trying to calculate could could material be subducted into the ocean floor? Mm. Uh, and of course, the result he came up with that uh, that no, it couldn't. Uh, right. it, it it actually needs some some mechanism where the material is denser to actually force itself through yeah. into the ocean floor. Yeah. So uh, and it, you know, and I, I think I think a lot of people have made that point that ha, ha, how can we imagine uh, this material, this lighter material of the ocean floor, actually forcing itself into the denser material of the mantle? Right. You know, yeah. So. Yeah, exactly. That's the same arguments I've I've heard as well. Mm. Um, I, I I think again, listening to all the po the probable and possible arguments, um, you know, you sort of start piecing together what seems to be sort of a consensus in expansion tectonics, mm. um, at least at least amongst people who have re are really serious about it and look at it. Yes. Um, I I think you know uh, simultaneous people who I admire coming up with very similar ideas. Um, you know, um, I think also sort of can sway, you know, what we think about it. But uh, there's I think I think this opens up, you know, one of the um, ideas. And that is, I mean, one of the main things uh, the, the of, of what you're doing in general, why we're even here and what we're talking about is paleogravity. I mean, paleogravity uh, really uh, is something that, in my opinion, should be. Uh, a area of study. We could, you could have hundreds of people around the world in paleontology, looking at um, ex examples of um, mass increase or the oh, not mass increase. Looking for examples. Oh boy, that's 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 too far in front. But uh, looking for uh, the idea that gravity was less. Um, can you mention? Was it you in your book who mentioned the sand dune height? That's a totally different idea of of the height of sand dunes, which and their relationship to the gravitational force, was that in your first book, or was that in somebody else's book? Uh, it, 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 yes, I, th I think that was in uh, one of the later editions. Um, okay. But um, can you can you talk a little bit about uh, that? Because what cause uh, we, some, we talked about uh, here is is femurs, right? Today we talked about yeah, dinosaurs yes, and, man, but, and animals, um, femurs. The, the basic idea. Yeah, go ahead. We have a delay again. Sorry. The the the, the, the basic idea is um, if you imagine um, building a a sand dune um, and the, the sand dune will not floor. So 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 uh, we. Just as we put more uh, sand on, it will it will fall down until eventually it stops. So so that's that's called the that angle depending on the strength of gravity. Okay. Um, so some scientists over in. Uh, over in America, you 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 you're part of the woods, um, and, and I can't. I'm afraid I can't remember the other the other um, scientist. Uh, but basically, they looked at ancient sand dunes uh, to try and see if the angle repose actually varied over time. And, Why would they, and they actually I found it did. That. I, wonder, uh, I have so a question the about past, that, Stephen. The, uh, I have a question about that. It, it, were they? Why were they doing that? I mean, yes. uh, it's interest. Wh wh why would they be looking for sand dune heights being different? I mean, I would understand that if you were a look, you were into paleogravity. But wh what was their motivation for doing that in the first place? Uh, I th I think it came from the other direction. I think I think they'd noticed that uh, the angle of repose actually varied with time. So they were actually looking for some sort of explanation 
of why why it might actually vary. Uh, so, so that's I, th I think I think one of them was a geologist and one was a physicist, and so they'd, they'd actually come together and uh, uh, to try and work out well could it be the strength of gravity that was uh, changing, and from that they they gave um, the uh, uh, a variation in the strength of gravity, uh, and when it, when it, when I found out about it. I contacted uh, doc, uh, Dr. Mann uh, at that time, and uh, we, we agreed that the, the um, strength of gravity that we were calculating was round about the same using our di different methods. Um, Holy cow. I, Did they write I, a paper on that? Uh, they've written a paper on that. I probably got, I, I must have that, I think, somewhere on my, um, I, I've got a list of, papers on my website uh I, I must have that somewhere it was probably in the 1990s probably that was written um i've 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 more or less lost touch with uh, dr man now so so that i don't really know what happened you know if anyone took that any further or not but um yes it was it was it was certainly an interesting result isn't it yeah, but that that shows goes to show you there's there's quite a lot of different directions you can yes. take in paleogravity. That paleogravity in itself, there's just, I mean, in my my guess, there's a lot of evidence probably out there, and it's really remarkable to me that the, even in the small amount of evidence that's been looked at by a very small amount of people, that things are lining up. What so I think shocking shocking to me is that, oh well, gravity was about half about 170 years ago, 170 million years ago. And, you know, uh, who says that? You said it, um, James Maxwell said it, maybe these guys with the sand dunes are, are seeing the same kind mm. of thing. Mm. What other things are out there and why aren't we out in geology getting degrees in paleogravity? Mm. Yep, yeah, it's, it's just because everybody believes that, uh, grav you know, uh, gravity has never varied uh, and it comes back to this idea really that the earth was created at uh, at its present size uh, what you know thousands of millions of years ago it was it was supposed to be the size it is now and it's 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 just that everybody's got this concept in their mind and they, they can't quite quite can't quite see past that yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, well, physics doesn't tell us that there could be mass in increase, especially if mm. it's subatomic. Um, people aren't, and so physicists aren't telling us this, and they go through their mind of all the obstacles that they're going to put in the way of doing, uh, you know, looking into that. Uh, there's just a lot of pressure. But I think eventually the pressure is going to become more and more that, of, that something's going to, you know, uh, hopefully crack and just like the <laughs> earth expansion uh, excuse uh, the pun yeah it's gonna crack. <laughs> <laughs> okay um do we have any more questions for uh steven uh about paleogravity um uh, one uh, again um uh this is steven hurl he has written a, a book recently called uh, let's get back to uh, uh here we go he's written a book uh called the hidden history of earth expansion um, if you haven't read that, and if you haven't read his other book, which is, uh, oh, by the way, did you take a look at, did you get any uh, reviews of your new book on Amazon? Hint, 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 hint. Oh, yes, I did. Yes, it was a very oh, nice review from oh, uh, somebody called uh, David De, De Hisler. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I I decided. Come on, folks. This is somebody's got to put it down. But I, I you know, I I always try to write. I don't even know where I was. I was standing with my phone somewhere, and somebody needed to talk with me. And I said, "Wait, hold on. I've got this important thing. I've got to finish here." <laughs> yes, so the lovely. world just works works in a different way. Hopefully, we'll get some other people. So if you have read the book or you haven't got it, get the book. Um, it's truly fascinating. It's a great uh, introduction to Earth expansion or what. A lot of us call expansion tectonics, um, and the dinosaur book that you have that uh, uh, Stephen um, wrote before is also a really great book. Uh, I think it's a little uh, easier to read in the sense of you know it's more colloquial and 
And uh, uh, this, but this book is if you if you really want to re get into the nitty gritty, see the history of it because this history has gone on for quite a while, right? I mean, this is not something that happened overnight. This has oh. uh, happened over over I guess over a hundred years, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, easily. Um, uh, I mean, the first the first one I have come across uh, was actually a uh, over in Britain. The Yorkshire Geological Society actually had a meeting about it in 1859. Oh my goodness! So, uh, and uh, the, the uh, two of them were actually presenting the concept that uh, the Earth might have expanded at that time. Uh, oh. so, so, this is uh, this is uh, you know really ancient stuff. And then uh, so. Uh, it was interesting that um, a lot of a lot of the people, a lot of the early people, didn't actually realise that somebody else was ha actually having the similar idea. Uh, yeah. So, so the so the next idea was actually in uh, uh, actually over in uh, France, I think, uh, and in just before the turn of the century, uh, and then. Going up to the, the, then in Germany, there's there's a few more, and then we have uh, in 19, 1933, Hilgenberg wrote his famous book about Earth expansion, mm. uh, and and at, and at that time, nobody knew about any, anybody else. Oh, oh, and there was there was some more guys over in uh, over in Russia as well. I should. I should uh, mention that some guys over in Russia, uh, but but nobody even believed that um, at that time that uh, continental drift was real. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so it sort of drifted then right up to the 1950s, really, where where uh, Carey started getting involved, and and again he redis he rediscovered the idea of Earth expansion. And then when it when he went through and actually started looking uh, at uh, it through the libraries, he actually discovered that there's quite a few other people that had actually come up with this idea before. So so he realised then that actually he he wasn't the first to discover it, but uh, all these other people had, sure, uh, sure, had sure. done quite well. But but well, but it was Carey that did most most of the work and. Uh, he, he he carried it forward, and uh, it looks like to me as though he more or less had to wait until he'd retired, until he could go back to it. But once he'd retired, he he actually took on this mantle of actually trying to trying to promote uh, Earth expansion. Yeah, at that time uh, he had so. no money or reputation uh, to worry about, right? Well, he, he he had his um, yes, he had his pension all locked up, so uh, so he could do what he he wanted then. And yeah. it, it, I, I mean, it's quite interesting. Um, some of the guys who uh, who uh, I've got in this this book um, that they actually mention that uh, that they they've got up to re retirement age, so they now have a, a stipend of their pension <laughs> to keep right. them going and they can spend all the time they want on actually looking at what they're interested in which is obviously earth expansion yeah, so, so sad, actually really, they yeah. find themselves in the same boat of actually actually putting it. yeah it yeah, is it is yeah what, i mean it's um, it's sad in life where you have such an amazing we topic? allow yeah. people to actually yeah. 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 oh well, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about um <clears throat> Here, uh, we're coming up on about 30 minutes left. Let's, why don't you tell us a little bit about your future work? Um, obviously, you just got done writing a book. Um, also, uh, you are giving this talk, right? Um, maybe two things. One, explain, are you, you're, give, you're supposedly giving this talk somewhere, correct, in the future. And then also, what your current work is, which is, I, with, I think, with flying dinosaurs. Maybe you tell us about that. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I mean that talk I, I gave today. 
uh, I'd actually arranged to go over to the uh, Polish Geological Congress uh, to give that talk over there. Uh, and, and obviously over in Poland, uh, the, the, there's quite a few geologists over there who, who are interested in the concept of Earth expansion. Uh, so, so it would have fitted in perfectly there to, to actually go over it. And, and uh, obviously, unfortunately, that was in June uh, and uh, coronavirus uh, sort of re reared its head. And uh, of course, the conference now has been, uh, it's been certainly abandoned uh, for, for June. Um, and they might possibly have it next year. So, so, so you know, uh, sort of it, events overtook us, I think, with uh, with uh, actually presenting that uh, at a, at a uh, geological congress. Uh, I, I have presented it uh, also at uh, my local uh, Liverpool Geological Society. I've presented it there and obviously everybody there was, was uh, quite interested in the concept as well. So They were interested? Come on. I'm, so are, you think that the geological uh, community... You know, one of the things I found is I went on a talk in the late 1990s with my mentor, Dr. Carazzani, Dr. Ricardo Carazzani, a physicist yes. from Argentina. Yeah. And he went, we went to give a talk. He went to give a talk. I gave a little bit, but he was the, the main speaker. And he, he was talking about um, how special relativity is incorrect, what the problems he found were. He corrected the, the equations and what was resulting was really more Newtonian universe. But um, it seemed it was funny because at that point we were talking about the Big Bang, and this was in the again late 1990s, and the the astronomy club there, which actually Einstein himself actually went there a couple of times, it was on Long Island in New York. Um, they were they had no problems. In fact, they would say, "Oh, you know, we've explained away redshift everywhere except between gal galaxies," and yeah, the Big Bang's a big bust. Now you're talking to an astronomy group who are extremely, how do you say, extremely serious about what they do. They make mm. their own telescopes and they do all those kinds of things. But they seem to be way ahead of the actual astronomers with all the b big bucks and big telescopes. Is that the same thing that you find in the geological world? Um, I don't know. Um, I think... I think I think geologists um, uh, that 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 they they tend to actually uh, report on what they actually see. So 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 if you go out and see a mountain, you'll actually uh, report on all the slump structures in the mountain. Uh, so uh, so quite a few of them have a different way of looking at science. It's 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 really a different type of science from what you might see in physics, where, where in physics, I think it's uh, a lot of things are theory driven. So you mm -hmm. start from the idea of a theory and then you try and actually look for evidence for that theory. But but from from the point of view of geologists, uh, I think a, lo a lot of it is you, you, you're actually doing it the other way around. You're, you, you're actually coming up and actually trying to investigate what it is actually there. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so but it, if that's the case, then why aren't geologists uh, embracing expansion tectonics, which, in my opinion, has a way more. I mean, it's it. How do you say it's a Occam's razor? It way simplifies the whole plate tectonics movement. I mean, it's ridiculous the way the plate tectonics works. Right. I mean, if you've seen the way they try to graph that stuff, it's ridiculous. There's all these problems of having, you know, oh, Australia, Western uh, Eastern Australia has the same rocks as, as what's in, you know, North America. How does that happen according to, you know, plate tectonics? So you have all those things. Um, maybe it's because it's more theoretical. But what I'm asking you is, is you went to speak on something that was about um, uh, the gravity being different. You must have mentioned expansion tectonics. But if you, why aren't you then, if, if that's the case that, you know, geologists are open to what they see and, and what you can point to, why, why aren't you giving talks at Cambridge and Oxford? Uh, I, I think probably because there's more money up at Cambridge and Oxford than there is round at our local um, geological society. So, so, uh, I, I, I mean, I, I mean, what, 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 one thing that um, one 
quite senior geologists said to me is mm -hmm. that um, it, it's actually uh, a, a lot of these things are all politics. So mm -hmm. if, if you've created uh, your department, your geological department, you have, have to be quite a good politician to actually get all the funds in uh, and actually get all the money flowing in. Yeah. You know, so 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 uh, from that point of view, you you don't uh, the the people who are actually in charge don't really want something coming through and uh, rocking the boat, if you will, and actually making think maple pe making people think, uh, oh, well, perhaps I'm, I better not be putting money into that department because, you know, it seems as though the science isn't as solid as it should be. So. Uh, you know, it's, yeah, but uh, uh, so so is it? It's okay. So it's the politics, but mm. um, so that's what's keeping what you're saying. So in the smaller groups, there they don't have those political concerns. Don't no, do they see no. them? Do do they feel a little like well? Oh, we had Stephen Hurl talking about expansion tectonics, which is you know flies in the face a lot. Really flies in the face of plate tectonics. They don't see that doesn't seem to to bother them then at all. Uh, aren't there people there with geolo geological uh, degrees. Uh, look, I know one of the greatest scientists, in my opinion, of our generation who works on something. I'm not going to name him, but he's gave us a contribution, in my opinion, that's put his name out in history. He's a geologist. And he, and he said to me, despite all the I know that expansion tectonics has more, but he has clients he, that rely on him to do work. And and he uh, has to talk about subduction and he uses that to help. And he gets you know money to go to places to say, don't build a building here, build a building here. And so, yeah, the pol the politics of those. So these geological clubs, don't they have geologists with degrees there or that are they just more amateur geologists? Uh, no, most of them are uh, geologists. Yes. Uh, we, I, I mean, we have the whole range of um, uh, geologists. So so so, mm -hmm. so I mean, the idea is that uh, quite a few of them, uh, the more the, the ones with uh, uh, degrees can actually sort of sort of uh, you know, lead lead uh, the uh, walks around and have a look at uh, right, various right, places. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, Geology but, is very interesting. Yeah. But 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 uh, I think I think you get the whole range of um, at, at, as in anywhere uh, we, we we get the whole range. Uh, I mean, after after the talk, I had a few people come up to me and say, "Oh, that that was a brilliant talk." You know what, what what's happening now, sort of thing. Why isn't it, vir virtually the same thing you've said? Why isn't that right. being promoted? Um, and then we've we've gone right back to the other extreme that uh, you know it. it People are saying, "Oh no, I, I can't really believe that because uh, the me the main problem is uh, w w what is the maxim ma mechanism for actually mass increase." Uh, right. I think that's the main reason that people are are actually so, so, sort of saying, "Well, I, do I don't really, I don't, I can't really uh, believe this because I I just don't quite get how the Earth can be expanding." Even though there's all this evidence that it is, uh, so 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 so, uh, you know, we we do get the whole you, you get the whole range of uh, sort of thought about it. Yeah, when when people ask me what what I tell them, especially when they say, "Well, what makes the Earth expand?" I said, "Look, we have some very good ideas. In fact, they're starting to become more of a consensus of what people really think's happening." But I, I tell them, I said, "Look, the first thing you need to do." is just look at the evidence for it. Look at the evidence not only for expansion, but things like your talk here on the evidence for mass increase because you're not the only one saying mass increase. You've got the sand dunes, you've got um, um, uh, James Maxwell who came to me. Uh, he didn't say, Dave, the mass is increasing because of dinosaurs. He's, he, was, he, had a, a, he, he saw it on one of his walks on the plains of Australia, I guess. <laughs> but so what I tell people, I said, look, there comes a point in science where it, I'm I'm sorry. Okay, I didn't. I, I there comes a point in science where uh, I think I, th I think there's a, comes a point in science where you have to say, okay, the evidence is all pointing toward mass has increased. So let's stop arguing about it and try just try to solve it. 
I mean, that's one of the things about science. We get so many things that are indirect, and how many of the greatest discoveries that we have have come from those kinds of indirect, you know, those correlations. Well, oh, you know, it's all pointing to this. We can say we don't have a mechanism. Does it doesn't mean it's not happening? No. Look at the, the data. It happened. It's mm -hmm. not, the problem isn't the problem isn't there is no mechanism. The problem no. is, is we can't explain it. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the problem. And so I tell people, I said, look, we have good ideas. You want to hear them? Here are some of the ideas, you know, and you can give them all of them, accretion and all that and give them, you know, the idea of the subatomic particles. Other people say, you know, gravity's changing, you know, whatever it is, you know, do we have a consensus in mainstream science? Absolutely not. They, they're, they're not even t believing the um, expansion tectonics. But so I always tell people, look for yourself read it, make up your own mind. And when you come to it, the way I look at it now, it isn't a question of mass increase. It's a question of, of us coming to a consensus of how that's really happening. So, um, hmm. let's see. Uh, I, I, okay, there was a second yeah, part certainly, of the question Certainly that's you. the next stage. I yeah, but the, there's another qu part of the question before, let's see, I've got 20 minutes or so, 22. Tell us what your, since yes. this is uh, one of two, two talks with you, Tell us what you are currently doing, because I think it's really, really fascinating. What, what's your current um, study? It, it has to do with, um, first, uh, I'll give you a, people a hint. Um, he's only worked with dinosaurs that walk on the ground. Hint, hint. <laughs> uh, it, yes, at the moment, I've, um, uh, I'm looking at uh, some of the large pterosaurs. And I think, it, as most people know, uh, these these have actually uh, these actually produced massive animals uh, up to uh, ten meters wingspan, around about a quarter of a ton in weight. Uh, they were round about the size of a small plane. Uh, so obviously, wow. the the problem has been for ages that. Um, uh, these animals are just too big to fly, uh, and it, actually, if if we look at uh, if we actually uh, look at the calculations of how they could fly, uh, the calculations say they couldn't, uh, and it, actually, this this has been a, a problem right through from the 1970s when when some of these largest um, of these pterosaurs began to be found. Uh, the engineers came through and they, they, they said, uh, well, they can't possibly have been that large uh, because the uh, uh, because they simply couldn't fly. And of course, the paleontologist said, well, that's what we found that that, uh, you know, we, we, we found uh, that the were these animals and they've got all the uh, all the things that we need for them to fly so they must have been able to fly despite what your uh what your uh, calculations show uh and in fact so that's it that's exactly uh were they too big to fly and how did they manage it uh so so obviously one of the um uh one suggestion that has actually been around for decades is that uh if gravity was less then the animals could be could grow bigger, and so they could actually fly in this reduced gravity. Uh, and the, the, there's one chap, um, uh, Colin Pedicek, who is is actually um, he, he's actually quite well known in uh, in actually calculating uh, all the aerodynamics of bird flight, and he, he's written quite a few books about about it, uh, mm -hmm. and it. Uh, and he's actually been saying for uh, for decades, uh, well, w one one possibility might be that gravity was less. Uh, he he's actually written a computer program that calculates all the wow. uh, all the aerodynamics for bird flight, uh, and in in that program he actually put he actually allowed the uh, gravity to be varied. So we, we can actually just input into that uh, that uh, program, which uh, 
we can ju just input a variable gravity into that program and see how well these animals could fly. So, so, so that, so that's what I'm coming currently looking at the moment. And do hopefully, do you have I'll... any preliminary preliminary um, results? Um, anything pointing yet, or just just too soon to make any conclusions? Uh, yes, yes, I've I've got far enough to say that um, uh, the uh, the largest of the pterosaurs. Uh, these these ones with 10 meters wingspan uh, up to nearly quarter of a ton uh, if, if if we um, uh, if we actually plug all those uh, th th that that uh, those figures into the program we can see that they'd fly with about as much uh, athletic ability as the present day large flyers like uh, like wow. a swan or uh, something like that. Oh. So, 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 so it all points together that, uh, that uh, again, that um, uh, gravity was round about the same size, and these animals just grew to to the maximum size they could. Right. Uh, uh, now, and... here's a question here that's from Cornelius again. Um, if gravity were was less uh, than uh, then the air would be thinner, also hindering flight. Is that something? Also, uh, that's been looked into, or you're also taking. Do these people take into consideration? Oh well, um, actually, I, I looked at that. I actually looked at it from the uh, other point of view because, because of course, one other suggestion was that um, it, it wasn't that uh, the air was thinner. The suggestion was that uh, that uh, the atmosphere was thicker. And therefore, that allowed the animals uh, to to fly easier because because uh, it gives them oh, greater I got you. Yeah. greater lift. Um, uh, so I've actually tried that with the program, and uh, it 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 actually it makes a slight bit of difference uh, in into how much lift uh, that they get, but it 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 actually. Um, it, it actually doesn't make that much difference it it doesn't oh. make enough it doesn't make enough difference to enable larger animals to fly you know with with uh, uh, greater gravity or or even with uh, reduced gravity sorry so greater greater air pressure or reduced air pressure okay so uh, what you're so, saying is that the that that the it can't it does affect but it's very small and really can't be the expl explanation by itself yeah it's it's a very yeah change in gravitation in um atmospheric pressure uh doesn't really doesn't really change the results that much yes yeah, so. because if it if it did that i mean that's really one of the that's that's the main argument i've always heard even since i was younger because i i also had that kind of thinking like my goodness you know because i mean one of the things that's really interesting is to watch movies of of animated movies that have dragons in them right they're basically dragons i think really did come from uh, yes, dinosaur yeah. bones right so my my, my conje con, um, conjecture is yes, the, yeah. the whole idea mm -hmm. that human came with dragons because people found these dinosaurs and they thought you know these dragons live somewhere well if you think about it when you watch those animations there's no way these things <laughs> could fly. You can just, you sort of, you, as you've watched birds all your life, you sort of get this <laughs> model in your head about what can fly and what can't. What you see is this body and these little wings, and you're thinking to yourself, I've seen planes, I've seen, um, you know, you know, the, the, it's just, it's just ludicrous because you see them sort of going, whoop, whoop, and the, the wings aren't just not big enough. To, to in in my opinion, <laughs> so the sort of common sense that no. we humans have about flight from just observation of planes, observations of of birds, I always laugh at them. I look at them, I go, "Oh man, this is those are dinosaurs flying, and that ain't how it worked." So, uh, it, it if we look at the various birds that we can see today. Uh, small birds can easily take off, uh, and as they get larger and larger, 
and then uh, large birds are up. You just look at the various uh, range of sizes of birds. You right. can actually see that, um, right. and the, so the 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 limit today is around about sixteen kilograms, uh, possibly something for uh, an actual am animal to fly in in one G. Right. Now, I mean, the other thing is, too, we have, I think, somewhat closer to, well, you got flying reptiles as you have the, the you know, bats, right? And some of those bats are pretty big. Um, so that's, it, yes, are yeah. bat, even though, even though bats are mammals, are they more similar to what you're looking at with uh, pterosaurs? Uh, it, yes, probably. I mean, um, that they, they have the uh, leathery wing. Uh, right. So, so I, I mean, we can see the same same problem with the size of uh, animals with uh, large bats. Uh, sort of, a, so, uh, I mean, the, they're called the flying foxes in Australia, aren't they? Which which I right. always think is a nicer name. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, but 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 I mean, their leathery wings are uh, very similar to what we might uh, see with the pterosaurs. Uh, that I think the big difference with the pterosaurs in in that fo in that uh, drawing that you've got there, uh, they're actually standing up on all four limbs, and right. that the, the, they actually have some uh, fossils of a pterosaur landing, so they can actually tell that as it came and it landed, it landed with its rear feet first, and then it put its uh, four limbs down on the floor to steady itself. And and then it walked around on all fours, uh, more, more or less as we see in that uh, in that uh, drawing there. So, so, so how would you how would you find fossils of a bird in flight? Is it that do they have imprints of them or, uh, I mean, you know that that that's bizarre. I'm I'm not questioning it, but what what is but, how do you know you captured a fossil of something millions of years old that was in flight? uh it's it's just because it, it's when it was actually landing uh so so there aren't any uh aren't any prints behind it so it it must have landed somehow to to actually uh -huh. get there so it right. touched down and they can actually see as it touched down with its rear feet i think it actually touched down first and then hopped a little bit on its rear feet touched down again and then its front feet, its front arms came down, and it uh, it stood up on all fours as it came down, and and then once it had landed on the ground, it then walked away. Uh, so so they they have all that fossil footprint of oh, okay. of of that actual uh, landing. Wow. Uh, so uh, so at, at, I mean I mean obviously that's we we've got the evidence of the footprints. Uh, and the uh, the uh, the uh, arms at the front there, and I, I suppose what you're saying is that uh, we are in inferring the rest, aren't we? That, uh, sure, that sure. It, it 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 must have come in and it must have landed because because we can't see any footprints behind it. So, yeah, well, uh, that that makes sense. I mean, I mean, uh, it, mm. it makes sense, and it, not only that. We do have birds and and mammals that do you know have similar similar uh, how do you say form, and and so we do know that those kinds of things will go on. All mm -hmm. right, we have mm -hmm. ten more ten more minutes, and so uh, my question to you uh, and the and the uh, uh, flying reptiles uh, is this going to, is this going to be a talk of? It sounds like okay, uh, uh, here we go. Uh, it sounds like Stephen Hurl should be is putting together enough material that there would be a third book called Paleogravity. Mm, well, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I, I mean, at the moment, I'm, I'm just working through all these various ideas um, and I'm writing them uh, uh, as I go along. Uh, so, so obviously, that the, the, what I've been saying there about the uh, the large pterosaurs, uh, I intend to write that all out 
and I'll I, I'll publish that just 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 as a uh, sort of like a white a, paper. Yeah, just just as a PDF, uh, so so people can uh, actually download that and they can comment on that if they wish. Well, I tell tell you the other question I have is we have uh, obviously the CMPS is sponsor sponsors this. Again, they are the website for the uh, two websites for the CMPS are these websites you can see below, uh, Net Philosophy and um, uh, Science Woke. <clears throat> we do have this uh, forum. We have every Saturday morning from 10 a.m. till noon on Eastern Standard Time, three to f uh, five. Uh, European time and uh, 7 to 9 a.m. on the west coast of the United States. But uh, maybe, you know, I've noticed, you know, John Eichler's here. There's been other people. You know, this uh, this could be a, a way for people interested in expansion tectonics to uh, even maybe once a month to sort of get together and, and talk. Uh, um, uh, this is available to all members of the CMPS. Uh, I know I use it myself for the dissident channel because uh, just today um, we're going on pretty much a, about a two to one margin of people again who, who are subscribers to my dissident science uh, YouTube channel. But um, the idea is it's, it's available for this community, those people who are working outside of mainstream, who are what I say are doing serious, serious, serious work um, have. so. Something for you, uh, Stephen, to think about, maybe, and John Eichler. Um, maybe you guys want to, um, you know, we can, if, if that's the case, uh, we'll give you how to log in and, and use this, and, and I'd help you announce it. But even if it's once a month, maybe we could have a forum on the uh, expansion of tectonics. Uh, so it is available, and as you can see, anybody in the world can join in. Um, it works quite well. It yeah, I mean, I mean, John could obviously give a talk, couldn't he, on on his mechanism for? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I mean, I think he has already given one, hasn't he? Did didn't? Uh, it may be the case. Um, give one. At, um, Have you, John? Um, he's probably away. Or, John, are you there? He's having internet problems like me. <laughs> no, I I think he's okay. Um, it may be, or well. It's it's not muted here on my side. Okay, I'll bring him back down. But um, anyways, uh, yeah, uh, I, I think he has, but it's been a while. I mean, our first talk on expansion tectonics was by Dennis McCarthy back in 2008. Um, so I don't think we have this a lot. It's been more just sort of freestyle, free forum. We're trying to get people. So even if he had given that a while back, uh, it still may be uh, uh, worth it. John, are you there? John, John Eichler. Usually, uh, he's got a good connection, usually, and a good microphone. May have stepped away. But anyways, it is something for you guys to think about. And uh, all right, um, we have, what, uh, five minutes left. Uh, I've been watching the comments. There's been discussions between people and themselves. I've been trying to pick out anything that I thought may be interesting as a question for... Um, uh, our guest today, Stephen Hurl. Again, his website is dinox.org. It's got two great books. You should check them both out. In fact, um, I did a video way back. I started out three years ago. Um, I can't believe it. Three years I've been doing my YouTube channel. And um, I had a one of my, if you go to Dissident, uh, Dissident Science, and then look up books, I think I had my two must-read books, and one of my must-read books were Din uh, Dinosaurs and the Expanding Earth. So you should be very privileged that an esoteric, unknown person like myself has put you up on their to-read book. I mean, it's too bad I'm not somebody, then then it would maybe matter, but uh, <laughs> I would say to all my uh, list, <laughs> all to my subscribers out there, and, and I do have over 3,000. I want to thank everybody who subscribes to my channel. Um, uh, that uh, definitely uh, it should be a must read for anybody and it's an easy way to get into expansion tectonics you know James Maxwell's book which I think is the greatest uh, book in geology ever written in my opinion even better than Carey's because he had the benefit of all that data and all those people 
And he, as a geologist, literally took it as far as you possibly can. Um, and uh, that, to me, is the greatest ge geological book ever written. But it's a little technical, maybe at first. So I would highly recommend you get Stephen Hurl's book, Dinosaurs and Expanding Earth, and it'll get you into thinking, oh my gosh, you know, maybe there is something to Earth expansion. So uh, here's a comment that says, thanks, David, Stephen. Refreshing break from the norm we've, uh, uh, we we've bombarded with, <laughs> which is more or moving particles and charges, moving charges in electro electric fields. Mm. And of course, if you read my dad and I book, there is no ch thing that's char nothing is charge, you know, but uh, anyways, that's a whole different story. But it is it is great. And it's great to give uh, poor Franklin Hugh, who's every week here. Sometime, you know, most of the time we don't have speakers, and I absolutely invite anyone, including John Eichler, if you're listening, if you haven't talked to this group for a while, or want to put together a presentation, especially in the area of expansion tectonics, because you have people like Ian Cohen, who's not convinced yet. Um, I, I'd like to even just uh, uh, have a talk sometime with him and say, hey, how is it coming now, Ian? Uh, he's a I really enjoy uh, Ian's comments during the uh, Saturday morning chats here uh, on the CMPS uh, um, Saturday morning science chats. So it'd be interesting to get people who are, there's a lot of people, um, uh, Stephen, that don't know about um, expansion tectonics, really haven't thought about it. So uh, mm. I, I'm really hoping this will, I, I know that I've done a lot of work myself when we had our in-person conferences, I've given numerous talks on the subject. And uh, I have actually heard people like saying, oh, Dave, it's great that you bring this up because, um, you know, I really thought about it. And I, I do subscribe to this idea. I think this is the right, uh, this is correct. So, um, it, yeah, I think that's one of the reasons that uh, I actually thought of uh, writing the, the history of the Earth expansion. Because uh, uh, I, th I think a lot of people don't actually realize how much actually history there is. That's it, that, that book there, uh, how much history there is and uh, how, it's, how it's developed uh, yeah. over the years. Uh, it's, it's, really be, it's really started off, a uh, lot of the geologists were actually fundamental in actually bringing about the concept of continental drift, which then transferred into uh, plate tectonics. So they, they were all key individuals and a lot of them uh, when when they continued on, they actually uh, kept going and uh, decided that uh, Earth expansion was actually the cause of right. continental drift. Uh, right. And so uh, all the all the authors there are all able to come in and give us all very unique um, sort of uh, uh, you know histories of uh, how it developed in uh, we've got authors from uh, Australia over in Poland uh, Germany uh, uh, and uh, Britain as well uh, yes you know so so all of these we're all key individuals and they're all able to take us all the way through uh, I think and it, it gives us a very a very interesting history I think of how this this idea is developed outside outside the normal run of science. Sure, and I think, and the yeah. other thing about the book, which is really interesting, is the first part of the book, which is fantastic. Uh, congratulations, Stephen, on your history that you put together. Um, you know, it, I think the, one of the most interesting aspects of this book it tells, and if you go back and you want to watch, Stephen gave a talk uh, the week before on the book. And um, we talked about the book, but the most interesting aspect, I think, of, of the history of expansion tectonics is how close we came mm. to actually today, we would not be talking on a dissident uh, naturalphilosophy.org group or a dissident science YouTube channel. We, we would be discussing this at some grand university in the UK, the United States or around the world because yes, it would have yes. been the one that was accepted. We came yeah. so close. Yeah, so close. It was just the tipping point, wasn't it? And, yes. uh, you know, it very nearly tipped over into Earth expansion, uh, but it, it just flicked over the, the other way. And I think yeah. most of the people who, who actually objected 
were the ones who were objecting to continental drift and you know they 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 decided we we definitely don't we definitely can't accept this we might possibly accept continental drift but we can't possibly accept the uh you know that that the earth has been expanding expanding oh yeah no. i think it, it reminds me a lot of the choice unfortunately we in america it's somewhat embarrassing our politics somewhat embarrassing is an understatement in my opinion I mean, we, you look at who we are choosing between a uh, reality TV host and a guy who is literally has <laughs> Alzheimer's disease. I mean, there you go. I mean, which one are you going to pick? It's like, whoa. Yeah, yeah. It's like, uh, but uh, I, unfortunately, I, I think with Earth expansion, it wasn't quite like that. We actually had a very good, very viable candidate. Mm. You know, it just was at the time it was coming too fast for that uh, establishment to take those steps. So... They took a step in the wrong direction, but I think with, mm. with uh, thanks to you, Stephen, thanks to James Maxwell, uh, J, uh, John Eichler, and all the other people out there who are giving a voice to the idea that the Earth is expanding, that it's gaining mass. I think we're getting more and more people who are starting to scratch their head, look at it, and say, you know what? I think I think this may be the right way to go. And if we get enough young people who are doing this, then one one will write a dissertation, another one will write a dissertation, and the next thing you know, um, you'll have a pilgrimage at your door, and uh, you know an entire industry of of measuring uh, paleo gravity and PhDs. Uh, I hope that ha happens in our lifetime, Stephen. So keep eating healthy, mm. do exercise, okay? So so we can see this happen. <laughs> but thank you so much. Uh, you want to give a few closing words before we uh, uh, drop off here? Go ahead. Uh, oh, thank you very much for having me on your program again, David. And it's uh, it's as always, it's been uh, actually, you know, actually really good. Thank you. Yes, I know. Uh, no problem. I know the English are so uh, humble and aren't like we Americans who say, you know, like Trump. Oh, it's the, this is the greatest talk that was ever given in science today. You know, like that. <laughs> so, uh, but anyways, thank you so much. And I want to thank again, all the members of the CNPS who pay their dues. If you want to be part of the membership, it's like 35 bucks a month. If you're retired, 50 bucks a, a month, a year, a month, a year, sorry, 35 a year or $50 a year. It helps keep sponsor these things like this uh, web uh, uh, this uh, video conferencing that we put on every every year. We also have other services like uh, when we write our proceedings. So if you have papers you want to publish, we do have a proceedings. You can see some of those in the back here. We're not going to have a conference this year, of course, because of the coronavirus, but uh, we're going to be having it next year. We're not sure where. Um, but uh, thank you all for who support the CMPS. And I want to thank also my listeners who are here in force today, all you people from Dissident Science. Um, uh, I will be coming live using the same platform on Friday, starting next Friday, Dissident Science face-to-face -face chats with me. So uh, I appreciate all the, the patronage, not only on my channel, Dissident Science, but also uh, on the uh, CNPS as well. So thank you, everybody. We will see you next week. Next week we will have back will be Franklin Hugh, and they usually have open topics, and they talk everything physics and dissidents. So there's nothing that's sacred on the CNPS Saturday morning ch chats. We do stick uh, to physics and cosmology. We don't talk about anything else more like history or evolution or anything like that. For now, we, we have, an, uh, as I tell people, we have enough to fight against physics and cosmology, let alone anything that has to do with politics or anything else. So thank you so much, everybody. Once again, thanks, Franklin Hume. We'll be back next week at 10 a.m. Eastern time where your host, Franklin Hume. And if you want to give a talk, if you think you have something that other people want to hear that's scientifically based and has a, has a firm, solid ground in, 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 uh, in science, we'd love to contact us. You can contact us through our websites. Uh, again, I'll put those up here. Um, these websites, go to those websites or contact emails. In fact, you can just put contact at naturalphilosophy.org or contact the science work. We'll get them or David in front of those two as well. I'll get them and we'll... Uh, uh, look to put you on here on Saturday morning, just like Steven. So see you guys later. Ciao.